evening to all of you. I hope everybody has attempted uh, GT4. And uh, today in this session, we are going to discuss uh, GT4 questions of OMR subject. So without any further ado, let us start with the first question. Okay, the first question was the filament circuit uses what? Option A, step up transformer. Option B, step down transformer. Option C, potential difference of 65,000 volts. Option D, all of the above. All right. Now, when we talk about X-ray tube, okay. So, we have, sorry, right. Now, we have an X-ray tube, right. We have an X-ray tube. And we have cathode here at this end, right, with the filament. And we have anode here with the copper stem and tungsten target, right. When we studied about the structure of the X-ray tube, right, we have cathode, we have anode, and this is a X-ray tube window, right, from where X-ray photons are going to come out. Right now, when we uh, studied about the X ray production, what did we study? So, when you switch on the X ray tube, right? When you switch on the X ray tube, what exactly happens is current flows through this machine, right? Current voltage we uh, set up a uh, kilo voltage and current, uh, all right, and exposure time. Or there are some machines with the uh, uh, default KVP and MA already set, right? So this MA uh, requires or uh, it is required to heat up the filament, right? So this filament, when you switch on the X-ray tube, the filament is heated. And what exactly happens here is the electron cloud is formed around this filament, right? Electron cloud is formed. Now, we need to send this electron cloud towards anode. So, we need to energize these electron clouds, right? We need to uh, equip it, it with the kinetic energy, right? Now, how this will take place when you uh, uh, press the exposure button, this electrons here gets energized and gets the kinetic energy required to go from cathode to anode. Right, and after coming here, it they'll bombard on this anode and then produces this X ray photons. This is a basic X ray production um, uh, procedure. All right, now what exactly happens when you uh, have this transformer inside this X ray tube? Okay, when we studied about structure of X ray tube. We had this step up transformer, step down transformer and auto transformer, right? Now, what they exactly do uh, in this process, okay? So, when you switch on the X-ray tube, okay, X-ray machine, what exactly happens is the line voltage. What is the line voltage? It is normally 110 to 220 volts, right? Now. To heat up the tungsten filament here, we need not require this much of voltage. 110 to 220, we not, need not require this much high voltage to just heat up this 2 mm of uh, tungsten filament, right? So, what we do here is we decrease this voltage from 110 to 220 to 3 to 4 volts. And this is done by which transformer? As the name suggests, step down transformer, right? Step down transformer will reduce this voltage, line voltage to 3 to 4 volts. And this is uh, required to heat the filament. Okay. Now, after formation of electron cloud, we need to give the kinetic energy to that electron cloud. Okay, so that they go and bombard on the anode or tungsten target, right? Now, this work is done by increasing the potential difference. 
okay this work is done by increasing the potential difference now how will you increase the potential difference now the line voltage of 110 to 220 is too less to energize this electron cloud so what we do is we increase this line voltage from this to 65000 to 1 lakh volts and this is this conversion is done by what step up transformer as the name suggests it is increasing the voltage from 110 to 220 to 65000 to 1 lakh of volts all right so this step down and step up uh, comes into play uh, when you need to adjust the voltage all right now we have two circuits working over here first to heat up the filament so this is called as filament circuit okay this is called as filament circuit which is a first circuit to uh, help or you can say um, in the process of production of x-ray this is the first circuit that uh, we have second circuit we have is from uh, this cathode the electron cloud runs towards the anode so this circuit will become cathode to anode circuit right so what did we study the, for heating up the filament we need which transformer we need step down transformer right for filament we need step down transformer and for cathode to anode circuit we need which transformer step up transformer and that is our question here is the filament circuit uses which transformer option b it is step down transformer i hope this is clear all right uh, okay moving on to the next question that we have the distortion of metallic structure as a result of differential absorption is called as option A beam hardening, option B cupping artifact, option C cone beam effect, option D partial volume averaging. Now here if you uh, are not sure what exactly they are asking, by reading the given options, you will uh, come to know that they are asking about something called as CBCT artifact. CBCT artifacts. Now, distortion of metallic structures as a result of differential absorption. Now, what they are talking about is this artifact. Okay, what you see is the actual section of CBCT axial section of cbct all right now what exactly is happening here is when the x-rays pass through the tissues okay x-rays pass through the tissues there are different different densities of tissues like uh, example say enamel dentine pulp they have different different densities so these photons are uh, getting absorbed differentially meaning the enamel will absorb most of the photons or restrict most of the photons by passing through it okay from passing through that enamel that layer the thick layer of enamel right if we compare it with the pulp the x-ray photons will easily pass through pulp because the uh, it is soft tissue and density of the soft tissues is lesser than the hard tissue so photons will easily pass through it so this is what uh, happens when the photons pass through the tissues now when we talk about the metal here okay the metal crowns okay metallic structure so these the highly radio opaque structures what you see here is the metallic crown okay cap metal caps so what exactly happens over here is x-ray photons get absorbed by this metal by this crown say uh, what could be the metallic structures in the oral cavity we have metal caps then we have a pfm crown also right porcelain facing metal and then we have implants when we have implants also so these are some metallic structures uh, and this 
can absorb the photons, X-ray photons and leading to this artifact. Okay, this artifact and uh, this is basically called as beam hardening. Beam hardening and this is due to the differential absorption of photons differential absorption of photons right and this is divided into two subtypes of artifacts say we have cupping artifact cupping artifact and we have streak bands streak bands all right now what is cupping artifact here you see metal okay the shape of metallic crown is distorted completely and this is what you call it as a cupping artifact so distortion of the metallic structure is cupping artifact and streak bands you see your black black or dark bands right dark bands dark bands over here right these are streak bands these are also artifact due to this beam hardening all right and scatter is also there so everything together uh, we have as a beam hardening artifact and specifically when the metallic structure is distorted due to beam hardening it is called as cupping artifact so here the question the answer for this question is basically option B, which is cupping artifact. Okay. All right. Moving on to the third question. Yeah. So this is easy. So this radiograph which they have given, they denote it denotes which phenomenon they have asked. So options are fenestration, gemination, dilaceration concretions all right so this is very easy uh you all know what is gemination okay gemination is when the single tooth bud divides into two right and results in the formation of bifid crowns right then we have concretions concretions is what fusion of this two tooth with the help of cementum okay with the help of cementum is concretions okay fenestration we have in the periodontology okay uh, radiographically we have no uh, you can say feature for fenestration all right what is left dilaceration what is dilaceration so it is curve or bend curve or bend okay throughout the tooth length throughout or the anywhere throughout the tooth length is your dilaceration so bend uh, anywhere uh, along the length of the tooth okay bend or curve is called as dilaceration all right and what is the uh, feature when the tooth or the apex is dilacerated buccally or lingually okay so i have just put up this image okay what you see over here they can give you this uh, kind of radiograph and ask what could be the anomaly or defect here okay so when the dilaceration dilaceration is buccally or lingually lingually or palatally also okay then you see such a kind of um, um, entity okay with a target appearance okay target or bull's eye bull's eye appearance okay so in the middle it is well, it is nothing but the apical foramen right and this is the curved bend or the root that you see so it basically gives a bullseye or target appearance to the buccally or lingually um, curved or dilacerated tooth all right 
okay so i hope this is clear so what is the answer over here is option c dilaceration okay moving on further question fourth in pemphigus vulgaris the binding of igg autoantibodies to which transmembrane glycoprotein adhesion molecules causes acantholysis now here you need to read question very carefully so they are asking about which glycoprotein adhesion molecules okay which transmembrane glycoprotein adhesion molecules is responsible uh, or causes acantholysis okay so when you talk about the oral mucosa we have the layers of oral mucosa right first corneum then we have granulosum we have a spinosum layer okay then we have the basement membrane over here with the basal cells right with the basal cells what is first corneum second granulosum third spinosum this is basal right now when you take out this much part over here what do we have is the two cells two cells are joined two cells are joined with each other with the junction okay is called as desmosomes desmosomes right is called as desmosomes now these desmosomes are attacked by igg and autoantibodies igg autoantibodies in which condition in pemphigus vulgaris right in pemphigus vulgaris igg antibodies attacks this desmosomes and these desmosomes contains two important you can say uh, glycoproteins dsg1 and dsg3 okay so these are nothing but desmoglenes desmoglenes okay and dsg1 is specifically found in skin dsg3 is specifically found in mucous membrane okay dsg1 is found in skin and dsg3 is found in mucous membrane all right so which is the protein which binds or uh, with will be found in the desmosomes is desmoglein all right and when I, igg auto antibodies attacks this desmosomes this protein molecule is affected okay and that leads to this separation of this cells separation of this cells which is called as acantholysis acantholysis all right this is due to loss of epidermal adhesion this is due to loss of epidermal adhesion all right and pemphigus it is intra epithelial blister okay this acantholysis or loss of epidermal adhesion leads to intra epithelial intra epithelial bulla formation right so if we are talking about pemphigus vulgaris here intraepithelial bulla is due to acantholysis and which molecule is uh, responsible okay or which glycoprotein molecule is affected over here is desmoglein so your answer should be option b desmoglein okay all right moving on to question five which of the following effects have no minimum threshold for causation okay so we have studied radiation biology and we had studied about two effects first is deterministic and second one is stochastic stochastic right what is deterministic effect when you have a threshold dose above which the effects are seen 
above which the effects are seen. So this is the dose. These are the effects. Okay. These are the effects. These is the dose. In stochastic, there is no threshold dose. Any dose can cause these stochastic changes or can bring stochastic change. Okay. So, which of the, uh, the question is straight, which of the following effects have no minimum threshold for causation? So, what should be your answer here? Stochastic effect. Okay. Stochastic effect. Uh, and a little more about these two effects. So, deterministic effects are uh, basically have threshold dose. All right. And what exactly happens here? Above that threshold dose, uh, the tissue starts uh, showing changes, okay? So, uh, decreased tissue or organ function above particular threshold dose. And examples of it are xerostomia, osteoradionecrosis, cataracts, and decreased fetal development. These are deterministic effects, okay? And uh, just you need to uh, remember these examples because in one of the latest exam they have asked about which of the following is stochastic effect and they are given the options as a cataract uh xerostomia okay mucositis and the uh thyroid cancer okay and you uh, had to choose between this which is the stochastic effect so when you remember these examples it becomes easy for you to answer such questions right so examples of stochastic effects are leukemia thyroid cancer salivary gland tumors are heritable disorders stochastic effects are what it causes sublethal dna change or damage to sublethal uh, or damage to dna sublethal okay or it can bring about gene mutation because there is no threshold dose any small dose can bring uh, about this gene mutation okay so uh, radiation induced cancer mostly occurs due to stochastic effects okay just remember radiation induced cancer mostly occurs okay moving on further yeah i have just put up this table just to uh, have a, a little summary of these two effects deterministic effect examples mucositis right mucositis resulting from radiation therapy stochastic radiation induced cancer right cataract formation again under deterministic stochastic heritable effects okay uh, threshold dose in deterministic yes uh threshold dose no no threshold dose for stochastic effect okay uh severity of clinical effects so see this statement this statement is very important they can directly give uh mcq uh from this okay severity of clinical effects is proportional to dose remember in deterministic effect severity of clinical effects proportional to dose Okay, greater the dose, greater the effect. Severity of clinical effects independent of dose. So, small dose also can bring gene mutation or can uh, cause gene mutation. Okay, and that can lead to cancer, right? So, severity is independent of dose in stochastic effect. Okay uh yeah so this this much is enough for uh you to know uh about these two effects all right moving on further yeah question sixth unicameral bone cyst is also known as okay unicameral bone cyst okay i every time i emphasize on knowing the synonyms of each of the condition because they confuse you when they give you some um, name of the condition and they give you the synonym in op options so and vice versa and you get confused okay so unicameral bone cyst okay is the synonym for traumatic bone cyst right traumatic bone cyst okay it is also called as solitary bone cyst 
just write down the synonyms of traumatic bone cyst. Okay, it is also called as hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic bone cyst. It is also called as unicameral, of course, unicameral bone cyst. Okay, and again in the option they are given idiopathic bone cyst. Idiopathic bone cyst means the reason is unknown. Okay, idiopathic bone cyst. But the most uh, discussed uh, reason for traumatic bone cyst is trauma. Okay, so uh, this cyst manifests in the body of mandible most commonly. Okay, and uh, that is posterior mandible and it appears as a scalloping radiolucency and this scalloping might be okay like this will just scallops in between the tooth yeah so this might scallop in between the tooth also sometimes okay all right okay and uh, the margins are smooth scalloping okay and the propensity uh, to grow along the bone like the okc right okay uh, like the OKC, it has also got the propensity to grow along the bone. Okay, so the differential diagnosis when you see such lesions uh, can be OKC, TBC, that is traumatic bone cyst, and then you can just um, uh, you can just differentiate it with the help of aspiration test, right? Aspirate. Okay, aspirate of both is different. TBC aspirate will be uh, sometimes bo uh, blood, okay, or uh, sometimes uh, non-productive uh, liquid, okay, non-productive. That is, you cannot just uh, specify or you cannot diagnose the case with the aspirate alone. You need to have a histopathological, radiographic, uh, and all the things, okay, together to uh, get to the diagnosis okay so traumatic bone cyst clear unicameral bone cyst is also known as traumatic bone cyst solitary bone cyst idiopathic bone cyst so answer is all of the above all right moving on further yeah here i've just put up this uh, uh, radiograph so this is what is traumatic bone cyst as you can see the scalloping Okay, and the scalloping has occurred in between the interradicular portions of teeth, right? And it is grown along the uh, bone. So there is no expansion. So they have mentioned occlusal lateral occlusal radiograph also to just know that there is no expansion of buccal or lingual cortical plates. All right. So when such uh, cases you see, you always give the differential diagnosis for TBC or for uh, such lesions as OKC, TBC, etc. Okay. Yeah. Question 7. Identulous patients fit in all aspects is posted for multiple implants. The best diagnostic radiographic technique for site assessment is a panorogram, OPG, B CBCT, C C T scan, D MRI. Okay. Earlier, when CBCT was not invented, okay, uh, we used to send it for CT scan. Okay, and since CT scan is expensive, too expensive. Now the emerging technique in dentistry is CBCT. Okay, CBCT for implant is the best uh, thing you can get. Okay, to check the bone density, to check the length of the bone, width of the bone, the proximity of um, vital structures. Okay, so 
option B is the correct answer here. Okay. CBCD scan. Uh, so in CBCT, when you get it done, it is basically 3D imaging technique. 3D imaging technique and when you have the CBCT, you can get a reconstructed pano view. Reconstructed pano view means OPG view. Okay. And you see the images in all the three planes that is axial, coronal and uh, sagittal. And sagittal. So all the three planes okay and uh, what are the advantages of it when you uh, advise cbct for implants length and width of the bone second density of bone third proximity of vital structures okay from crest okay from crest you can measure all right so cbct is the best for implants okay moving on further uh, question 8 a four-year-old male with a round bluish macule on the hard palate. As you can see in the picture, we have the black or grey macule. Posterior incis papilla, but in your spot diagnosis. Okay. Option A on the tattoo. Option B, graphite tattoos. Option C, amido tattoos. Option D, endogenous pigmentation. Now, when you uh, see such a grey or black pigmentation uh, on the palate, First, ask history. So, not specific for this um, uh, pigmentation only. Any lesion you see, you first ask history to the patient. Okay, whether patient has ingested any drugs, any specific products. After that, he got this uh, lesion or the pigmentation. Okay, here we are talking about pigmentation. So you ask history to the patient what he has ingested or some drug he has been on. Okay, so like that. And among the given options, what is the most probable diagnosis or the um, lesion for this is uh, when there is a small kid okay and you see such a black or gray pigmentation exogenous pigmentation okay on palette the most probable diagnosis is the graphite tattoo graphite tattoo okay why because these children or kids have the habit of uh, putting pencil like the nip of the pencil into mouth Okay, and that nib can cause this traumatic implantation of graphite particles on the hard palate, right? On the hard palate and leading to this grayish or blackish macule on the hard palate. That is nothing but the graphite tattoo, okay? The graphite tattoo. So, what is the correct answer over here? Is the graphite tattoo B, okay? Amalgam tattoo. Uh, when you see the amalgam filling proximal to or in proximity to the uh, this macule grayish or blackish pigmentation, mostly this amalgam tattoos you see on the buccal mucosa, okay, or on the gingiva where this amalgam uh, feelings, okay, are proximal to this mucosal surfaces, right? That. Uh, in the, those cases, you can uh, give diagnosis as amalgam tattoos, right? So, yeah, this is your answer for uh, question 8. Okay, moving on further, question 9. This is characterized by the stuffy reticulated pigmentation and oral leukoplakia. Okay, so among these options, you have only one uh, condition where it is associated with oral leukoplakia, it is this keratosis congenita. 
okay this keratosis congenita and the remaining option we have is the keratosis follicularis uh, where in you see increased keratinization okay increased keratinization second one incontinenta pigmenti it is basically again a x linked dominant condition and it is manifest or it manifests in the neonatal period okay so whatever changes you see you see throughout the life from the uh, neonatal period till uh, the uh, old age you see the changes all right white sponge nevus you know again hereditary condition affects mucosal surfaces and uh, there is soft plaque like lesions affecting the mucosal surface mucosal surfaces include oral cavity esophagus okay um uh, yeah, so uh, this keratosis congenita, how it is uh, associated with leukoplakia is it is basically a bone marrow failure syndrome. Okay, it is bone marrow failure syndrome. Okay, and also very important point, it is a pre-malignant pre-malignant condition all right again it has a genetic predisposition okay and what are the main features that you see is the male dystrophy reticulated pigmentation and oral leukoplakia just remember this keratosis congenita all right okay uh, reticulated pigmentation includes uh palmo planta uh, keratoderma that is increased keratinization of palms okay uh, then um, it also affects neck face okay chest all right so oral leukoplakia condition associated with it is dyskeratosis congenita all right uh, keratosis follicularis again synonym dariors disease okay these are some new uh, terms you are uh, seeing here so i am just giving you a basic remember to be remember point okay keratosis follicular is darius disease what happens here is increased keratinization so you see uh, papules okay scalp will be a uh, highly crusting of scalp palms and soles uh, heavy keratinization seen okay oral lesions multiple papules are seen and nail changes okay red or white bands on the nails will be seen in keratosis follicularis or darius disease okay uh in continenta pigmenti i've told you manifests in neonatal period manifests in neonatal period okay again uh nail dysplasia eyes are affected here uh teeth and jaws are affected like microdontia okay or uh, uh, say uh, jaw growth is affected so in neonatal period it will affect throughout the life it will see in a neonatal period only and it will be there for uh rest of the uh, decades of life okay hair affected sparse hair then cns uh, or uh, cns system affected example microcephaly head diameter or size small mental retardation will be seen okay and uh, again the name the another name for incontinenta pigmenti is lock Sulch Berger syndrome. Okay, just remember this. Another name for it is keratosis follicularis, Darius disease. Okay, and white sponge nevus that we know already. It affects mucosal surfaces, hereditary condition. Okay, and soft plaque like uh, lesions are there in white sponge nevus. All right. Moving on to the question 10, the cleft lip and palate can be recognized in which week of gestation using transabdominal USG. Okay, so here is the question. Uh, when 
in intrauterine life okay when a uh, mother gets you you she die in which uh, in which week the cleft lip and palate is diagnosed okay mainly there uh, are studies different studies that states that 13th week to 39th 13 to 39 week is you can say uh, the condition can be diagnosed condition can be diagnosed okay but the mean week mean week where you can diagnose cleft lip and palate is 16th week just remember 16th week so what are our options here are 5th week 10th 15 20th which is uh, uh, closer to 16th week which is 15th week so our option or answer should be option c all right the mean week where you can diagnose cleft lip and palate okay using trans abdominal ulg is 16th week okay since it is related to cleft lip and palate it can be asked okay moving on for the question 11th temporomandibular joint is a unique of option a gene gingival arthroidal type b diarthroidal type c sin arthroidal type sin arthrodile and d mc arthrodile okay so what is the answer here is option a gingival arthroidal type what is this gingival arthroidal uh this gingival arthroidal states this word states that it is a hinge joint that is it shows hinge movement that is just open and close just open and close movement it is hinge movement right and arthroid means it permits the gliding motion of the surface so it permits gliding motion gliding motion of the surface okay so tnj or uh, the joint mainly shows which it's okay it is hinge movement that is this okay just uh, uh, for and the movement in part k okay and the gliding movement means this condyle will glide onto the surface that is gliding motion okay so a uh, gently more arthroid meaning it has got movements and therefore it is made it has a gently more arthroid okay so therefore this option a is the correct answer and you should know the meaning of uh, that word okay moving on for the question 12 gorlin sign is seen in gorlin sign is seen in c what is gorlin sign first that you should know gorlin sign is ability of tongue ability of tongue to touch the tip of the nose okay everybody cannot do this everybody cannot do this this is done by the patient affected okay when the patient affected by which syndrome ehlers danlos syndrome ehlers danlos syndrome is inherited disorder okay inherited disorder wherein uh there is excessive looseness looseness of joints excessive looseness of joint and elasticity of skin is seen elasticity of skin okay so patient can touch patient can touch their tongue to the tip of the nose tip of the nose all right and it is seen in ehler danlos syndrome what is your correct answer here option a all right moving on further question 13 identify the autoimmune disease shown in the image below okay so there are some uh, uh, 
pigmentation okay macular areas that you see all over the face all over the face and they have given options as mucous erythematosus erythema multiforme dermatitis herpetiformis and none of the above okay this uh, picture i feel is not uh, specific enough to give the diagnosis okay if i show you the next picture many of you will uh, give me the diagnosis immediately okay this picture okay what is this picture this is a, there is a erythematous uh, patch all over the uh, malar area right and the bridge of the nose all right what is this what is this called as malar rash right malar rash or butterfly rash butterfly rash and this is pathognomonic pathognomonic of which condition it is lupus erythematosus right lupus erythematosus so lupus erythematosus is basically multicystic autoimmune disorder okay in which 85 percent cases skin is affected okay skin is affected and multiple systems are affected and we are concerned with the oral cavity and the skin here okay so you should know butterfly, butterfly rash, malar rash and what is a, a variant of SLEC in the oral cavity. It is DLE which is discoid lupus erythematosus and what you see in DLE in oral cavity is the erythematous central area. Okay, the erythematous central area and then the Periphery is surrounded with the brush border like white stripe. Okay, brush border. It is called as brush border and white stripe. Okay, so this is the intraoral uh, variant of SLE, okay, which is DLE. All right, discoid lupus erythematosus. So even if you are not able to diagnose the uh, condition by looking at the picture, you can rule out the options. So option B is erythema multiforme. Erythema multiforme, the major pathognomonic sign is the crusting of lips. Crusting of the lips. If you see crusting of lips, go for erythema multiforme. Option C is dermatitis herpetiformis. In dermatitis herpetiformis, it is basically an autoimmune bullous disease. Okay, so dermal lesion will be seen and blisters, blisters will be seen. That is vesicles, okay, uh, on the erythematous base. Okay, vesicles bullae on the erythematous base will be seen in dermatitis her herpetiformis. Here, there is no such thing. So, you can go for lupus erythematosus. Okay, so just remember malar rash, butterfly rash in lupus erythematosus and the variant of SLE is DLE and the intraorally what you can see is the brush border like a white stripe surrounding erythematous central area. Okay, moving on to the last question, question 14. So, radiologically a staphylococcus cyst is distinguished from a traumatic bone cyst by Option A, they cannot be distinguished. B, both are same entities. C, staphylococcus cyst is situated above inferior alveolar canal. Staphylococcus cyst is situated below inferior alveolar canal. Now, when you talk about these two entities, staphylococcus cyst and TBC, right? Uh, in principles of interpretation, we have studied about the epicenter. When you interpret a particular lesion, you see epicenter of it. What is epicenter? Whether it is above inferior alveolar canal or it is below inferior alveolar canal. Right? So, this will give us the origin. So, if the lesion is above inferior alveolar canal, it is mainly in odontogenic origin. And if it is below inferior alveolar canal, it is non-odontogenic in origin, right? Non-odontogenic in origin. Now, when we talk about Stephanie's cyst and traumatic bone cyst, you should know what is Stephanie's cyst. Stephanie's cyst is basically a lingual depression. 
okay which is associated with the submandibular salivary gland okay so during the development of salivary uh, submandibular salivary gland this lingual depression will manifest radiographically as a oval or a rounded radiolucency below inferior alveolar canal okay that is not a, a cyst exactly but it is a lingual bone depression that manifests as a, a stephanie cyst okay and traumatic bone cyst we have already studied in the uh, question above right traumatic bone cyst we already know uh, the most discussed etiology of traumatic bone cyst is trauma to bone or trauma to teeth leading to this traumatic bone cyst okay so uh, the important difference between these two is the stephanie cyst is not odontogenic in origin traumatic bone cyst is odontogenic in origin and what will be your answer based on epicenter so stephanie cyst is situated below the inferior alveolar canal so option d should be your answer all right so yeah these were the 14 questions of uh, omr all right i hope you all have got it right and uh, yeah if you have any doubt you can post it in the chat box below or you can uh, post it in the telegram group that we have all right so yeah all the best for next gt and we'll see you in next gt discussion thank you